Mr. Fellows, can you tell me what a clearance diver does? That many of their bombs weren't exploding when they hit our ships. Making the bombs safe now fell into the hands of the diving team. You want to tell my wife, I'm in the South Atlantic, I'm on a warship that's under attack by enemy aircraft, we've got a bomb that I'm sitting astride of, and I don't know what the bloody hell I'm doing, but at any second now I'm likely to kill myself and 450 sailors. Mick, how are you, brother? Uh, I, I'm very, very well. Uh, just suffering with the aches and pains of old age, you know, in my 80s now. So my misspent youth is catching up with me. Shit, mate, I'm in my 50s and my misspent youth, <laughs> you've caught up with me about 20 years ago. So yeah. you, 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 you're looking incredibly well. Well, yeah, no, I'm, I'm feeling well at the moment. Good, 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 good. And so, friends at home, I'm utterly honoured to host Mick on the podcast today. Warrant officer, first class with the Royal Navy, but so much more than 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 that probably means to a lot of people. Uh, if I can just put it in my layman's terms, we, we had the Falklands conflict, the Falklands war. Yes. The gentleman that I'm chatting to today... Um, and it, this has been said by uh, Brigadier Julian Thompson, who was the commander of the land forces down there in the Falklands, that without this gentleman that I'm chatting to now, the war could have had a very different outcome. Mick is uh, not only a diver, but uh, what we call clearance diver. So clearing mines, bombs, anything that goes bang that is going to take a take a ship down. You were down there and you were literally saving the ships from sinking by defusing the live bombs that had landed on the ship but 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 hadn't hadn't yet gone off. Um we're also going to talk about the Herald of Free Enterprise, which anybody of my generation, a little bit above, a little bit below, will remember was the awful awful tragedy um that took place when this passenger ferry rolled over on its way i believe it's to uh, zebruga and it was a, a, a an international tragedy and i know Mick, that you were heavily involved in recovering the bodies from from that that vessel I guess we start at the beginning, sir. <laughs> what what made you want to join the Royal Navy? I, I joined the Royal Navy in uh, 1955 at the age of 15. And that was at St. Vincent's Training School, Siemens Training School in Gosport. Very much against my father's wishes. During the war, he'd been working uh, on minesweepers and had a pretty rough time. And he really wanted me to have some other trade. But I, I went against his, his wishes. And after six months at St. Vincent, started thinking, I wish I'd really taken your advice and got another job. I'm not too happy about being in the Royal Navy. Having said that, I did my year at St. Vincent and then joined a frigate, uh, HMS Lock Killisport, which was due to go to the Persian Gulf via the Suez Canal. But the Suez conflict, stroke war, started at that very much at that very very time. And I was asked, or not asked, really told by my captain that on board the ship they were short of divers. And in those days we had standard divers, large helmets, and all this sort of thing. They needed to increase a complement, and I had just volunteered to go on a diving course. That's all very good, but I can only just swim. So at the age of 16, I ended up on a diving course at HMS Defiance in Wilcove and then joined the ship and we sailed around the Cape to the Gulf. Now, I, I, I enjoyed being a diver, apart from the fact that my main task in the Gulf was uh, assisting the standard divers to investigate cargoes that have been ditched overboard by Arab Dows. Now, there was a death penalty 
in, in, in the Gulf at that time, in Bahrain, for any ships that were importing arms, ammunition, gold or slaves. And slavery was a big thing in 1956 in the Gulf. We would creep up at night on the ships, darkened ship, and try to catch them out. But if they saw us coming, they would throw all of the arms, ammunition, and unfortunately, the slaves over the side as well, still attached to their shackles. My job as a 16-year-old was to dive down in an oxygen diving set with a large hammer about the size of a, 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 a today's dustbin and photograph the victims on the seabed. Bloody awful job for a young lad. Uh, I left St. Vincent after, uh, left, left, left the Lockyer Sport after 18 months, joined another frigate uh, in, in the Far East for a tour of the Far East. And I was there during the Malaysian confrontation. So did a fair bit of time diving offshore, but again spent most of my time on a train traveling backwards and forwards between Singapore and Penang as an armed guard. Uh, I was an armed guard with a 303 rifle, but they didn't trust me because I was only 16, 17 at that time with ammunition. I left there and went to the Dartmouth Training Squadron, not to join the officer corps, but, 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 but as a diver and a seaman, where I met a uh, Lieutenant Commander Guy Worsley, who later uh, turned out to be the superintendent of diving. And he convinced me, he was a keen diver himself. We did a lot of diving together, mainly picking up lobsters. But he convinced me I really ought to leave the sort of basic seaman branch where I was a trained man with a little bit of skill in gunnery, in torpedo and anti-submarine, in radar, but no sort of great knowledge about anything whatsoever. And I ought to change branch to become a clearance diver. He explained the clearance driver's role for me. And I thought, that's just for me. Right, he said, but the only snag is you have to go to sea for at least another 18 months to get the bare minimum three years experience in before changing branch. I changed branch to clearance diver, uh, which was an eight-month course at that time with an 85% failure rate in, in 1960. And, and then... Uh, joined uh, the, the, say, the clearance diving branch. The role of the clearance diving branch at that particular time in the early 60s was clearing up all of the unexploded bombs and mines that had been left from the Second World War, which, of course, was only 15 years prior to that. And there were hundreds of them around the coast, of mainly at the uh, east coast of the UK and Scotland. Mate, you blow me away already, and I, I think you've blown our audience away. So... Just before we go any further, I just want to say a special thank you to Mick Ivers. Mick, hello, if I'm, I'm, I'm pretty sure you're going to watch this. It was Mick that put us in contact. Mick was HMS Antrim in the Falklands. Folks, we'll put a link below for uh, the podcast I did with Mick. So, Mick, massive love to you and your 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 family, shipmate. Um, this is just... <laughs> um, this has just allowed the podcast to have... a a chat like i say it's just blown me we uh, me away already mick what so if you're 16 and you're having to photograph slaves that have been thrown overboard did it does how do you deal with that mentally because they didn't have any mental health services and and any understanding back then well well i, I was perhaps just fortunate that uh it was the days I was too young to have the trot and run. The run was still in that day. That would, that would have helped. And sometimes the, the, the older divers, standard divers, would give me a little sip of their run, which helped a little bit. But that, that was it. I, I just learned after a while to, to get over it. And over the sort of following 35 years in the Royal Navy, I actually trained myself so that I could go down and recover a, a corpse, a body on a seabed, and I could come back to the surface and, and, and report that I'd been covered either a man or a woman or a child. I could give it a size, but I could entirely wipe out their facial features. I never, ever recorded the facial features, which was very, very handy, as we're going to talk about the Herald later, when we were covering the victims of the Herald and the parents and 
uh, loved ones of the, of the victims would be on the shore showing me photographs and saying, have you seen my son, daughter, whatever? And I could quite honestly say, no, I haven't. All that I know is today we recovered X number of children, X number of men, quite a few lorry drivers, because lorry drivers have been on the water for seven, year, seven weeks, put an extra lot of weight on with the water they took it. Some of them were heavy already. Uh, so so, so I, I trained that after a while. Uh, a few friends and people have asked me, how do you cope with recovering corpses and how do you cope after dealing with a terrorist bomb or a mine? And, well, if possible, I go and have a couple of pints down the road and that really is quite sufficient. Gosh. I just feel like we, we need to thank you on behalf of humanity for everything that you've... I, I mean, I bet those victims' families, are, uh, well, obviously they're devastated beyond what what we can ever understand it, unless you've been in that, but at, 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 at least you've helped them to get cl closure, Mick. Is that the right word? Yes, it is. Yes, 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 yes. Gosh. Yeah. And... I'm sure we could chat for hours and hours, mate, but coming on to the Falklands, gosh, what 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 was your first knowledge of that conflict? Right. Well, I, at, that, at that time in 1982, even before that, 1981, I was second in command of the fleet clearance diving team. Uh, the fleet clearance diving team mainly had a, uh, was a Navy's commitment to NATO, and we attended all the various NATO mine sweeping, mine clearance exercises around the world. And in uh, early 82, we were in Gibraltar on exercise spring train. And I was ordered with my boss to return back to the UK uh, early and to go to Fort Southwark, which is just north of Portsmouth, and meet uh, or report to Commodore Mike Clapp, who was a Commodore Amphibious Warfare. Uh, we went to see the Commodore and he said, I suppose, gentlemen, you've heard that we are almost likely to be going to war now with Argentina over their illegal occupation of Gripwick and, and the Falkland Islands. And in fact, neither of us had heard about that. He then said, I'm expecting when I take it, if I take a task force down there, to come across mines and other unexploded objects uh, that the Argentinians were laid to prevent our troops landing. I've asked for minesweeper assistance to clear the minefields, but I've been told that minesweepers aren't available and that the new hunt class mine hunters are too small uh, to go all the way down to the Falklands Islands. Why don't I try taking a clearance diving team? He then said he admitted he'd never heard of clearance divers before. So then he said, Mr. Fellows, can you tell me what a clearance diver does? and how you could possibly assist me. After about half an hour of talking to him, he said, how soon can you be ready to mobilize? And I said, within 24 hours, sir. On the 15th of April, with my team of uh, 16 guys, I flew or we flew to uh, Ascension Islands via Diego Garcia. We went there ahead of all of the troops and ships to set up the facilities on Ascension Islands for the troops to exercise firing their weapons when they arrived so that they had reasonable ranges and we were in a position also to deal with any misfires. We also needed to be there early as a lot of the ships were coming direct from operation, uh, the operations in the Mediterranean, the exercise, and others were coming from the UK without having had the time to repair any damages or do any routine maintenance on the hull. So we were there. Part of our capability is if need be, we can change the ship's propellers. We can do underwater patching and repairs if necessary. And when the fleet arrived, it was very, very necessary. We set up operations on Ascension Islands and all the ships arrived at various times over the next two or three weeks. We did repairs to the hull, and we also searched the ship's bottoms most evenings or when some sailor or 
uh, merchant seamen would spot an enemy frogman in the water placing limpet mines on their ship. It was normally a shark or a dolphin swimming around, but we had to search the ships most nights, day and night, uh, for limpet mines. Part of our task is to remove limpet mines from ships. We transferred from Ascension Islands on, onto the uh, RFA of all fleet auxiliary, Sir Tristram, for the passage down to the Falklands. Once our government had decided that, yes, there was going to be a conflict, stroke war. On the way south on Tristram, we had the Royal Marines Mountain Arctic Warfare card on board and, and various other troops. And we took the opportunity on the way down to uh, get to know their various weapons and, and, and to do a bit of practice with them. As, a, as, a, as basically as a seaman in the Navy, you don't really touch weapons at all. If they do give you a rifle, they never give you any ammunition. A sailor in those days with a rifle was bloody dangerous. We arrived down in the Falklands, and I was told that D-Day was to be the 21st, only told the night before, and that we would be required from 2.30 in the morning on D-Day to go into the beaches, if necessary, to clear any beach obstacles and explosive devices. That wasn't necessary. And the Commodore later on said in his book that, in fact, he sent the landing craft in full of soldiers and Royal Marines, really to land on the beach and to test whether there are any weapons there or not. At about 11 o'clock on D-Day, the morning of D-Day, the 21st of uh, May, I was handed a pink, sig pink denote secret signal saying that Antelope, this is HMS Antelope, the destroyer, had been hit by an unexploded weapon and needed immediate assistance. It didn't say what the weapon was, just an unexploded weapon. I got all of my two chiefs and my lieutenant commander in charge and asked in a sort of politish way for any volunteers to go and deal with this weapon. Uh, there weren't any forthcoming, really, and it was made fairly obvious that it was above my chief's uh, pay rate and, uh, you know, I was possibly the most experienced. I, I, in a way, I was quite pleased. I, I wanted to do something. I got hold of two of my uh, sailors, divers, uh, a leading diver, Jan Saul, and a naval diver, or diver, Nigel Pollen, and we waited for a helicopter to come to Sir Tristram to take us to Antrim. Shopper landed, we got on board, took a couple of tools with us and a bomb bag. Bomb bag has a few explosive charges on it and bits and pieces which we couldn't really use on, on, on a ship, but that's all we had. We took off on the chopper, and on the way out of St. Carlos Water, and we, we were dodging enemy aircraft coming in that were attacking the ship at the time. The pilot asked me on the intercom, do you know where Antrim is, Mr. Fowles? I said, I've got no idea whatsoever, sir. But I do know at the moment she's protecting Canberra, and Canberra is a bloody big white ship. So why don't we go to the entrance and look for a white ship? We did just that. We flew quite low because the enemy aircraft were coming in from all directions. We, got, we saw the Canberra in a distance, and I could see the Antrim actually sort of doing figure of eights at great speed around the Antrim with all of her guns firing. Uh, protecting Canberra, sorry, protecting Canberra. My uh, pilot said, right, Mr. Fellows, get yourself into the strop and we'll lower you down below the, the, the chopper so that you can land on the uh, flight deck as soon as, uh, as soon as we get you down there. Right, I got into the strop. They lowered me about two, three metres below the helicopter and we started diving in towards the end trip. The Antrim uh, was told we were coming and actually changed course from zigzagging onto a fairly straight course to make landing for me easier. As we got fairly close, I heard this horrendous noise, looked up and saw two enemy Argentinian aircraft coming in with their guns, cannons blazing in front. I could hear the fire from the cannons whistling so close, I lifted my knees below my chin because I thought it was going to hit me. My chopper pilot obviously saw the same and thought, bugger this, I'm getting out of it. So he shot the aircraft off to his left, 
and at the same time lowered inadvertently lowered height, perhaps, perhaps forgetting I was underneath. I was immediately dumped into the Atlantic Ocean, and it was bloody cold. They dragged me through the ocean for what felt like about two and a half hours, but in fact was probably only about one and a half minutes. I lost my shoes. They both disappeared. I had a bomb bag over one shoulder, and I ditched that as well, thinking I was going to drown, but not with that weight on. The pilot then started to raise height again, pulled me up out of the window, out of the water, and winched me back into the helicopter. I was then given a pair of earphones, and he said, bugger that, Mr. Fellows, we can't do that again. I'm going back to St. Carlos. Took me about five minutes to say to him, no, I don't think you really can do this, sir. We've got a ship down there. It's got an unexploded weapon on board. If I don't get on board to make that weapon safe, I wouldn't like to be responsible for the repercussions. He then said, OK, Mr. Fellows, we'll give it one more go. We did just that. But I thought, right, you're not going to catch me in that strop again. I'm going to stand in the strop and hold on to the wire. The winchman very kindly took his gloves off and gave me his gloves so I could hold on to the wire. So we came in very low again, me standing in the strop, holding on to the wire. I could see the antrum again going fairly straight uh, on a fairly straight course. But the whole of her after deck now was covered in white foam. It looked like snow, covering Hemphier helicopter, which had been shot up, and 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 uh, the, the the fuel which sort of putting a damper on the fuel which had flown all over from the helicopter, flown over the flight. There were patches of red blood as well all over the place where people had been wounded. Right, so as we came in very low, I took my foot out of the strop, let go and dropped on the flight deck. I dropped onto the flight deck and found the only hatch that was open and landed astride it. Bloody hell, it hurt, it hurt. <laughs> I managed, managed to stand up after that and the Lieutenant Commander Grace Girdle said, right, Mr. Fellows, I'll show you the bomb. The first weapon, uh, first mention of bomb. I said, no, we'll wait so my two assistants are coming in on the next transfer. They arrived. He took me down below decks uh, and aft to what was the, the, the heads, the toilet compartment, uh, the after toilet compartment. There was wreckage all over the place. But between the wreckage, I could make out the outline of a bomb. Now, the bomb had been uh, fired by an Argentinian aircraft towards the stern of the ship. It had gone in through the CCAT blast doors on the back end, bounced down off the missile compartment, and the missile compartment was full of missiles and, 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 and occupied the whole length of the ship. It had then bounced up off a missile through a pyrotechnic magazine, hit the underside of the flight deck, ricocheted down into the toilet and, and, and stopped there. I started pulling wreckage away with my hands from the bomb so I'd get a closer look at it. And then I could smell smoke. The smoke then turned into flame and we realised the pyrotechnic magazine next to us was on fire or the pyrotechnics were on fire. I got my two guys to run forward and uh, look for some firefighting equipment. They came back with extinguishers and started putting out the fire on the blazing pyrotechnics uh, whilst I cleared more of the wreckage away from, from around the bomb. All the time we were doing this, the ship was doing 20 plus knots through the water in figure eights, throwing us all over the place. And the captain very kindly would shout on the, inter the, uh, on the internet, there's another attack coming in now. And we knew that from the amount of fire going up from the entry, and then eventually from the amount of fire coming down from the attacking aircraft. And initially, we left our position by the bomb and ran forward for shelter. Bloody stupid. We ran forward into a mess deck, and I saw a table there. And I went to dive under the table, only to find out that my leading diver, Jan Saul, was already under there. He looked at me and said, you might be the boss, sir, but fuck off. I was here first. <laughs> and I looked at him, looked up, and saw we were both 
hiding under a five ply wooden table that wasn't really going to protect us for anything. And we were working alongside what I thought at that time and confirmed later was a £1,000 bomb. We had a bit of a laugh, then decided, no, let's get on with the bomb and forget all the future bombs. I worked around the bomb, clearing wreckage away while my guys were putting out the fire, and then in between times assisting me with cold chisels and hammers and hacksaws that we got out of a first uh, uh, damage control locker, clearing the wreckage from the bomb so I could get towards the tail end to see the state of the fuse. I realized after a while that the tail end of the bomb had snapped off on its passageway through the ship. This is normal. The tails are not held on very strong. But beneath the tail, there's, there, there's, there's, uh, the, the fuse is, is attached to the tail end of the bomb. And the fuse has uh, veins on it, propellers, small propellers, which actually, when the bomb is released from the ship, turn and they release an arming device. It's like a, a small, small fork inside the bomb fuse itself. But I would normally look to see if the veins on the fuse were still there and what state the arming prong was in. But the back end of the bomb with the missing tail was so badly damaged, I couldn't see that at all. Uh, we worked on the bomb, clearing the vector away and trying to get to trying to, to, to identify the fuse for about four or five hours when a, a petty officer telegraphist came uh, in, into the heads and said to me, Mr. Fellows, you're required in the wireless room urgently. And he said, before you can say anything, they've told me it's urgently and I'm not to return without you. Fair enough. I walked with him to the uh, wireless room and I could understand that obviously simply to the authorities needed to know what type of bomb had hit the ship and in fact what state it was in. This, this, is, this is normal as such. I'd never come across secure speech before in my life. I put the headphones on, got hold of the microphone and the voice in the headphone said, hello Mick, this is Hamish Lowen. This is a secure speech nobody but you and I can hear what you're saying. So please speak openly and free. Oh, right. He said, what have you got, Mick? And I said, I've got a British 1,000 pounds bomb with a damaged tail fuse. He said, are you sure it's British? I said, well, it's painted olive green. It's got a red band around the front. Red denoted in those days high explosive, whereas yellow does now. And I said, there's a little tally on the side it says, made in Bilston, Wolverhampton. <laughs> so, yes, I'm sure, sir. Right, Mick, he said, sorry. Uh, what? How can we help? I said, well, I've got a bit of a plan in my mind at the moment. I've not, uh, I'm not too sure it's what I'm going to do, but my intention is to actually move this bomb aft about half a metre or so, and we're one deck below the flight deck. So then I'm going to part all the wires on the deck head, the ceiling for the civvies listening, above me. I don't want to cut any wires and stop the ship guns firing or the steering working, etc. I'm going to part all the wires. Then I'm going to cut a hole in the flight deck. I said, really? I said, yes. And I'm going to rig a shear leg, shear legs, or get a crane, and I'm going to gently lift the bomb to the upper deck and gently lower it over the side. Mm. He said, really? I said, yes. I said, but what I want to know is can I afford to do that? Is this bomb likely or that fuse to be uh, have an anti-disturbance device or a delay? And he said, right. Patched in on this conversation, although I said there's only the two of us can hear it, is Tony Lombard, a defence explosive arms disposable Disposal Technical Information Centre. The voice then come on and said, Hello, Mick, this is Tony. I've heard all that. I've got the Army, the Navy and Air Force, all the experts in the military around me at the moment. Computers buzzing. We'll give you an answer soon. He said, uh, It's unusual to find a British bomber. I said, Yeah, very, very really unusual, etc. And we had a bit of small talk, although I was keen on getting back to the bomb. He then said, Mick, 
unfortunately, we can't help you. He said it could have a delay. If it's got a delay, it's possibly a 28-minute delay. And as the bomb hit now over an hour ago, it possibly it should have gone off by now. But it could also have an anti-disturbance device in it. He said, so we can't help you at all. He said, move the thing as gently as possible. And I said, I intend to. He said, as if you've got a spirit level on top, don't let the bubble move at all. So I said, thanks very much indeed, sir. He said, but Mick, I can do you a favour. I said, really, Tony? He said, yes. He was a neighbour of mine in Yapton, West Sussex. He said, I'll telephone Irene, your wife, and tell her what you're doing. And I said, I won't repeat what I said, but I basically said, are you taking the piss? You want to tell my wife I'm in the South Atlantic, I'm on a warship that's under attack by enemy aircraft. We've got a bomb that I'm sitting astride of, and I don't know what the bloody hell I'm doing. For any second now, I'm likely to kill myself and 450 sailors. I put the phone down. What I didn't know, and I heard later on, that as well as he and I and Hamish Loudon on the, uh, on the intercom, the Prime Minister was listening to this on a tannoy system in number 10. She then said to the commander in chief, who was the uh, not the commander in chief, the, the uh, first sea lord, Admiral Fieldhouse, who is this man? Where did we find him? And if he's still alive after the war, which I doubt, I'd like to meet him. I met her later on. I went back to my bomb. But you, you, I, I, I know that you were um, friends with Margaret Thatcher and, and it, 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 hearing your story, it's not, that's not surprising to, to understand. Yes. Also, we should point out that you have an MBE DSC. Is that distinguished service? Distinguished cross? service cross. I'm yeah. the, the only non-commissioned man in the British Navy to have that. And a BEM. G. BEM for gallantry, which is a four, forerunner of the Queen's gallantry medal. I'm I'm listening to this, mate, and I'm tempted to say, do you understand, like, superheroes? That's just like in the movies. Uh, it, it's... This, this hanging off helicopters, this, that's literally the stuff I watch with my seven-year-old when we're watching a Spider-Man <laughs> Spider film. Um, in, incredible. And, and just this in itself is like why have we never seen a documentary or or a, or, or even a, a a dramatic film made about uh, about you know not just your actions obviously every everybody that was that was down south and 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 the the people supporting them but it's um do do you ever feel this has been play played down i mean I, I i think i looked on wikipedia i think it just said it took 10 hours to you know yes. make the bomb safe there's nothing about what 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 you're telling us the, the the unfortunate thing and this is for the whole of the clear drivers that were down there we had three teams down there team one which was my team basically doing bomb on my disposal looking after the ship ship repair uh, team number two which was on the dennis the sea spread and they were doing repairs on ships afloat. And Team 3, which again was a bomb of mine disability. Now, all of the operations, which I'm going to tell you about shortly, that I carried out, were never, ever reported to any higher authority. My reports were lost. Had the Prime Minister not been listening to the conversation with Tony Lombard and Fleet, no one would have really known about my operations on the Antrim. Albeit, that operation was the first time an unexploded bomb had been removed from a surface warship mm. in the mm. history of the Royal Navy. Mm. Never been done before. There was no precedent, no equipment, no procedures. It was just, unfortunately, the clearance diver element reporting uh, procedure was non-existent. Doing the job, I, I came from a pretty lowly background, born during the Second World War, not too good in education, but mainly that was my 
my fault. I wanted to get out and away from it. But when I changed branch to clearance diet, I actually found there was something I could do. I could help save people's lives. And uh, I, I was pretty good at it. Yes, and I, I, I just say it a little bit if I can say about Navy divers in general, because I, I had the pleasure of being on HMS Invincible in the Royal Marines Detachment for a year. Our guys were very much made welcome to be any part of the ship that we, we had one guy. He, he actually like studied to become the bosun or a buffer or, or, <laughs> or uh, you forgive me. It was a, I, for, I forget the terminology, but you know, he had this thick affairs folder of all this, the stuff he learned ship wise marines we were allowed to grow beards for example this might surprise people yeah. at home we had to ask permission from the captain but you could be a royal marine with a bit there, there was even stuff said and I, I don't want to go too much at a tangent but i think this is fascinating that you could actually apply to have an earring and a and a a tarred let's just call it a ponytail or or jack jack tar or what it, um but my my point is a couple of our guys did the the diving course and it's incredibly tough folks you're talking this is like commando you know on a on a on a par it's not just that oh just chuck a wetsuit on and get no the they the, when i did it they were down there is it horsey or some some place in <laughs> Yeah, and and you've really got to prove your worth when the ship's up there in Norway. It's Antarctic conditions. The the water levels, the temperatures probably probably uh, minus one because of the salt. It can go go below the zero, mm. and you got to get your kid on. You got to get over the side if the ships. If there's any, you know, if the ships run aground or or whatever it might be, or the propellers got fouled. Um, very very brave profession mick and something we don't you know people talk about paras and marines and sas and da, 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 da. this this i'm i'm so honored now that we can give this the uh you know the the, the attention this profession the attention it 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 it, it deserves and can you just re repeat what you said this is the first time ever a bomb has been made safe on a ship in active service that is is still moving. Is that right? Yes, it, it was the first time of an unexploded bomb had been removed from a surface warship at sea. Now, prior to that, in 1942, a submarine HMS Cachalot on the surface was, was bombed uh, by German aircraft and two bombs uh, one was wedged in the Conin, by the Conning Tower, one in the upper, just underneath the upper deck casing. And two uh, seamen, Roberts and can't remember the other chap's name, uh, a, 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 a sub lieutenant and a, and a petty officer, actually removed the bombs and threw them over the side, having been told that if the submarine come under attack again, it would dive straight away, leave them to the mercy of the sea. They both received Victoria Crosses for that. And V.C. Roberts actually joined the clearance diving branch after the war. But this was the first time in naval history that a surface warship had been hit by an unexploded bomb. We weren't prepared for it. We weren't trained for it. There was no equipment for it. Mick, what, what we've got to remember is you're down there with the task for, force. We've, we've heard of the infamous Bomb Alley. And all of you, all of you, you guys, the, the 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 sailors, the the infantry, marines, parachute regiment are all all on board these ships at various stages. How does that? How does that? How did that affect your mental state? Knowing that at any moment, any ship you were on could be hit by a you know struck by an Argentine a missile from an Argentine jet. Uh. I, I was aware of that situation, of course, but by the time or at the Falklands in 1982, I'd already had 23 years of a my disposal experience in some pretty awful situations, including Northern Ireland, of course. Uh, so, so I, I wouldn't say it, it didn't worry me, but it was just something I'd learned to live with 
and, and just got on with life. I knew what I had to do, and uh, I just kept my fingers crossed and hoped that uh, bombs weren't going to hit us and uh, that we would survive. That's all you could do. Mm. And how did the rest of the war progress for you? Right, well, uh, my, my, my procedure for lifting the bomb out of uh, Antrim worked quite well. We, we, in fact, cut a hole in, in the flight deck. The buffer on board rigged some shear legs for me. Shear legs are very much like an Indian TP, you know. Uh, we, we gently lowered the bomb over the side. As I did so, I said to the captain, would you please, when I ask you to, go full ahead and hard to starboard. And he said, why hard to starboard, Mr. Foes? I said, well, I'm going to let go to take on the last thing I want is for it to be wrapped around your propeller. So <laughs> we, we did just say, he invited us into the wardroom then for a meal. We hadn't eaten for about 10 hours. And he said, I would give you a drink as well, Mr. Fellows, but I've got another little pink signal here for you. He pushed a signal into my hand and I read the signal. And he said, Mr. Fellows, HMS Argonaut has just been hit by two bombs, which are unexploded believed to be French bombs, proceed to Argonaut immediately. My immediate thought then was, bloody hell, I've got two chief divers on the Tristram and a lieutenant commander. There must be unexploded bombs all over the place to uh, keep them busy. Uh, I went across to Argonaut and, in fact, uh, my two chiefs were there and they told me uh, that the... Uh, Two, bo two bombs on board. One had hit, gone in through the starboard side of the ship, got into the forward magazine on the port side, killed two sailors inside, and flooded that magazine, and of course was still there. And they'd started patching a hole on the side so we could pump the magazine out. The other bomb had gone into the after machinery space, and fortunately, two warrant officer royal engineers bomb disposal, had appeared out of the blue with lots of equipment and said, can we help? And my chief, quite frankly, I said, yes, please. <laughs> and they were dealing with the bomb in the after machinery space at the time. Uh, I could see things were going well and I wouldn't be able to do anything with a bomb in the magazine for a couple of days at least till we've got a patch on it and, and pump the uh, water out. But I su suggested to Captain Lehman, captain of the Argonaut, that he take the majority of his crew off that weren't required and, and, and uh, as a ship was out of action totally. So in the event of an accident, we weren't going to kill too many or have too many casualties. I, back in my mind all the time is that I was very, very lucky that I got away with out any casualties on, on Antrim. It could have been 440, 450 uh, dead crew mm -hmm. and a lot of Marines are on board as well. Anyway, uh, I went back to Sir Tristram because I'd been ordered to leave Sir Tristram with my team and join Fearless. Uh, we loaded all our equipment onto a landing craft and on the way to Fearless, I thought, right, I'll go back to Argonaut first of all, see how my chiefs are getting on. I went back over there and then thought, okay, I'll have to work out a mythology now for getting rid of the bomb that's in the magazine. It hasn't exploded. It's un underwater. What I'm going to do is I'm going to use the same procedure as I did on the Andrew. I'm going to gently lift it out, and lower it over the side. But to do that, I had to look for an escape route to lift it up through. Mm. So I, 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 I looked throughout the ship and I decided I use the light jacks there equipment, long rope system, from winches back aft. On the, on the quarter deck, I run the, the rope for, for it and then cut various holes through bulkheads, deckheads, etc., so that I could then lead it down to the hatch above the magazine. Right, and I then went and sat on the hatch of the magazine and I was looking up for eye bolts and bits and pieces above me that I could attach tackles to to lift the bomb. And as I was looking up, there was an enormous explosion and the ship shook. And my immediate thought was, you're dead. The bomb's exploded. Then I realised I wasn't dead <laughs> and the bomb hadn't exploded. So I raced together with lots of other people to the upper deck, only to look out to see that the 
antelope, uh, the, 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 the uh, antelope, yes, only about 200 yards from us, mm. had in fact exploded and was on fire. My chief then said to me, the engineers that were working on our art and machinery space removed the fuse from that bomb and had gone across to antelope. There was no need to tell you you were busy. I said, I, I, I can understand that. I said, right, let's get into our landing craft, just a couple of my guys, get over to Antelope, which was burning fiercely at this time. It was burning, and there were, there were sheets of metal actually floating through the air on fire. I went alongside Antelope to see if we could help crew members off and all that, got fairly close when a couple of these burning sheets of metal landed on board my landing craft. And I thought, bloody hell. I've got about 600 pounds of high explosive on the landing craft as well, which I use at all. I just can't afford to hang around with a fire falling all around me in the heat. So, so we had to leave them to their devices. I learned later, of course, that the two Royal Engineers uh, had gone across there and used what we call a rocket wrench, which is a good piece of fuse extraction equipment, really for use on land not really designed for use on a warship, but they'd had three attempts at defusing one of the bombs and the third attempt, that bomb had exploded and killed Jim Prescott and uh, injured John Phillips. He, he lost his left arm. Uh, I went back to uh, Argonaut and said to my two chiefs, right, I'm, what I'm going to do is write out a procedure now uh, for, for removing the bomb based on the procedure that I'd used on the Antrim. And I actually drew some little designs and all and gave them to him and then said, right, I'm going to Fearless and I'm going to then bring the boss of the team over who will join you on board and, and do the liaison supervising removal of your bomb. I knew it was going to take some time because we still haven't successfully patched the hole yet. Went to Fearless. A couple of days later, I was uh, summoned to the offices of uh, Kept, uh, Commodore uh, Michael Clapp, who said, Mr. Fellows, you've been around a long time. What do you know about beach clearance? And I said, well, what do you want to know about beach clearance? Sir? I know just about everything I, I, uh, there is to know. In, in my younger days, I'd actually gone to... Uh, to uh, Pool to Hamworthy, and with the Royal Marines, the SBS, I'd done a landing craft obstacle clearance course, and I, I was part of a NOCU landing craft obstacle clearance unit at the time, mm. before it was disbanded, and that role was given over to the SBS. He said, so so you're quite confident in that role? I said, yes, I, I am. So he said, right. What we'd like to do, you to do is take a party of uh, men, behind enemy lines into Bluff Cove and find an alternative landing area for the Royal Marines and the two or three power to go into when we get closer to standing. Not, not a problem. Uh, I was told my team would convince, would, uh, would, 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 would consist of a sergeant SPS and two SPS uh, divers, four uh, Royal Engineer uh, my detection guys and myself and three of my my, my divers. Uh, we went into Bluff Cove at night in a special forces chopper. I was quite surprised how quiet it was running. And, and uh, this chap, it was quite a frightening drive in because there been in lots of helicopters before, but he skimmed the surface of the sea as we went ashore probably only about two metres above the, the, the water level. I thought, bloody hell. Then we hit the land and we were going up and down over hills and mountains and trees at about the same height. Mm. I never realised at that time he had one of the four pair of night vision glasses, but it was the first time he'd ever used them. And the navigator next to him without the night vision glasses was advising him now and again, you know, up a bit, down a bit or whatever. We, we, we travelled for about half an hour, uh, and I was sat in the, in, in, in the or standing. There were 12 of us in the back of the chopper, but fairly close to the cockpit, and I heard all these alarms started going off and red lights flashing. 
and the pilot just leaned over his shoulder and shouted, we're going down a lot. And we hit the deck at hell of a rate of knots. Fortunately, we were only about six foot up off the floor, so, so it wasn't that big a drop, but we hit, hit it with quite a bounce. Uh, we flew over the doors and prepared to jump out. We said, stop where you are. We, we stopped where we are. We were on the ground for about 10 or 15 minutes while he and the uh, co-pilot were fiddling around with bits and pieces. And he said, right, we've overcome the problem. We can go again. We landed in Buff Clove, Bluff Cove. And we're met by a, a, a local farmer who, who'd been told that we were coming in, who uh, took us to the, 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 the banks of Bluff Cove, uh, just by the, the, the entrance of that, uh, to, to the bluff itself, and, sh and showed us uh, a way around and said that the Argentinian military were in force on the other side of Bluff Cove quite a lot, and we really shouldn't make too much noise or use radios. That was no problem because we had no radios. The SBS had their Sarvo sets, but we had no radios. So I said, okay, well, what we'll do, and I got all my guys together, is we'll use, we had right angle torches, but with a red glass on them. We'll use diving signals, lifeline signals. Four pulls means pull me up, five bells means finish work, etc., etc. The 36 different signals that you normally give on your lifeline. We'll use those as flashes on the red torch so we can talk to each other at evening. And it worked. I got one of my divers to swim across the whip of Bluff Cove, towing a line with him. Once he got to the other side, a second diver took off for the shore, and he, as they both secured the line, and he would come towards the second diver. So they crossed in the middle, looking for bombs, mines, and obstructions. They would then move the line up a metre or so and do the same again. The Royal Engineers, with their mine detectors, checked all the shoreline on the friendly side, and the SBS then swam backwards and forwards, checking the gradients for landing craft and coming on the beach and looking for any tetrahedras or obstacles that could be on, on, on the force. There were none. The SBS then decided they'd go around the other side of the occupied uh, area uh, to, to gather intelligence, which is quite right, and that's what they're very, very good at. Mm. We went back to the farmhouse and the farmer's uh, wife had cooked a lovely, was cooking a lovely dinner for us. And he said we could sleep in the street pens that night before we were lifted off tomorrow, the following day. The SPS returned, but they had 12 Argentinian officer prisoners with them. They said that the RGs had actually surrendered to them, were coming looking for them, and that they were in a pretty bad state. But the SPS had relieved them of their ration back, so we'd have something to... Uh, extra to eat. We didn't know the farmer was going to feed us at that time. Our ration packs weren't all that good. On opening the officers' ration packs, Argentinian ration packs, we found a miniature bottle of whiskey in each one. Oh, brilliant. We hadn't had a drink since we left Ascension Arms at that In fact, since we left the UK at that stage, none of my team. So I said, OK, I'll keep the whiskey until we finish the conflict and we'll celebrate a little bit later. This comes to light in my story in a minute. We got back to Fearless and made our report, and in fact, which was that Bluff Cove was suitable for a landing, if need be, at a later date. We then carried on the rest of the war doing repairs on various ships and, and uh, damaged propellers. We worked on a couple of the submarines that actually bounced off the seabed or hit rocks. The last time the Falkland Islands had been surveyed professionally, it was in the 1800s. So the charts of the area weren't very good at all. On the 8th of June, I had a signal came through again. Uh, we thought the, the war was about to end. It was getting close. So I decided we, we'd drink the whiskey. There were 16 of us. So we drank the whiskey, and I suppose it was about a thimble full each. Not nice, not a lot, but, but it really was nice. When I was handed another signal, saying, HMS Plymouth, has been hit by four bombs in a nice, polite way. Get your ass over there, Mr. Fellows, and sort it out. So, oh, whoopee. It, it was dark, night time. Got into our Germany and drove well, about half an hour's drive to where Plymouth by that stage was at anchor. We could see Plymouth because she was on fire and listing over to the, the port side, but on fire quite a bit. Uh, we got to Plymouth. 
most of the blazes by the time we got there had, had been put out, but it was still glowing in places. I was met by a sub lieutenant on the quarter deck who, uh, once I introduced myself, he said, right, Mr. Fellows, I'll show you the bombs. I said, no, sir, thank you very much. I'd like to go to the bridge first to meet the captain. He said, right, sir, follow me. And he shot away like a racehorse. Now, the ship was totally dark, in, in, in total darkness, no lights on it whatsoever. So I thought, well, I know where the bridge is, but I don't know my way around this ship. So I walked forward towards the bridge, and I think I bumped into every obstruction on the upper deck on the way. It was so dark. Climbed up the ladder to the bridge. The bridge door was open, and there was one little red night light on the bridge. I could see quite a few people on the bridge. I stepped into the bridge, and I tripped over the sperm water, the little ledge underneath the door on the bridge that stopped water going into the bridge itself. As I tripped over, I fell and supported myself on my hands as I hit the deck. But I was quite aware when I breathed out of the smell of stale whiskey coming out on my breath. And I thought, oh, bloody hell. An arm assisted me back up right again. And I looked up right into the face of Captain Pentree, captain of the Plymouth. I thought, oh, whoops. I introduced myself quickly. And he said, right, Mr. Fellows, what do you need? I said, right, sir, is the communications back to the area where the bombs are? I didn't know what the state of bombs were. That's it. He said, no, but we can run a hard wire for you. I said, well, will you please do that and have someone fairly responsible on the bridge with no pad and pen who can write down all the instructions and routine that I, uh, that I give him as a, as a progress? He said, yep, yeah, I can do that. And I said, then could you get all of the ship's company that aren't involved in keeping the ship afloat as it is, the firefighters mm -hmm. finish, get them all on the foresail, please, lower the guard rails, get them all dressed in a once-only suit with their life jackets inflated. He said, yes, we can do that. And we don't need many people, a couple down the end room, perhaps a couple in the damage control HQ. I said, right, sir. I went back aft and looked at the damage. One bomb, the four bombs had actually hit the Plymouth. One had gone straight through the funnel and out the other side. One had bounced off the flight deck. It had hit, as it was bouncing, it hit a depth charge that was on the flight deck, an aerial depth charge, which was about to be loaded onto one of the choppers and set light to that. But the air crew actually kicked it and rolled it, so it fell over the side. So the bomb and the depth charge had fallen over the side. The third one had gone through the Mortar Mark 10, the anti-submarine mortars magazine, damaged five mortars inside pretty bad, bounced back up and hit the centre barrel of the Mark 10 mortar firing mechanism, the three barrels on, on the upper deck. It had actually gone through the centre barrel and bent that. It had a mortar inside it as well, which hadn't exploded. And the fourth one had gone straight over the side. We... I went into the, the magazine and there were damaged Mark 10 depth charges all over the place. It, it, some had fallen out of the racks, damaged. There was explosives over the deck, and over the deck. Uh, pretty bad mess. I saw a small locker there which had safety keys in and I knew from my sort of tacit torpedo anti submarine experience on my frigate 25 years previous to that, that there was a safety key that you put into these Mark 10 mortars uh, to stop them actuating uh, when, when they weren't ready for being fired. The trouble with the mortar bombs, and my plan was, of course, was to throw them over the side, was if I hadn't put this key in and deactivated them, as I throw them over the side, they got to a certain depth. They were going to explode anyway and sink the ship. So I thought, bloody hell, can't afford to do that. We... Put the keys in all the depth charge, all the Mark 10 depth charts. I couldn't switch them to safe. I then took about three or four hours separating all the wires in the damaged depth charges and, and, and insulating them so they wouldn't touch and make a circuit and perhaps explode the depth charge again. Didn't know an awful lot about depth charges, apart from a little bit I'd learned on the course 25 years previous. Uh, 
once I, I, I was fairly safe that all the electrical wires were insulated and uh, we weren't, they, they weren't going to touch, we then got my two guys to clear all the broken, uh, the explosive that was lying all over the deck and then dustpan and brush and, and, and just to throw that over the side. And then we got them both on the upper deck and we rigged a takeoff and passed it through the entry hole where the bomb had come into the magazine, into the magazine. I then rigged another takeoff inside the magazine above the racks holding the bombs and I gently lifted the, the, the Mark 10 mortar bomb so that I could attach their takeoff to it. And with my legs, pushed the bomb as they pulled on the table, out through the entry hole, one at a time, about five bombs. So we got them outside, hoisted them up to the upper deck, and then very gently lowered them over the side, over the side on a spare bit of rope, knowing that they wouldn't, or hoping that they wouldn't go bang because I'd switched off the safety switch. All the time I was doing this, I reported uh, my, my actions to the uh, officer on the bridge who noted them down. But we were very, very aware of the rest, all of the ship's company, 250 in the ship's company, on the forecastle singing all the time for about six hours. But they were singing hymns, like for those in peril on the sea, etc., etc. And I thought, stinks a little bit of lack of confidence. I didn't really blame them, but there we are. I finished it, and the uh, officer on the bridge uh, said, is that finished, Mr. Fellows? And I said, yes. He said, what about the sea cats? I said, pardon? Are you calling the Mark 10 sea cats now? He said, no, we have two sea cat missiles on the port side on their mortar that were damaged by cannon fire. One started smoking and we've put the smoke out now with, with, with a hose, but we've still got two damaged missiles up there. Could you possibly look at those? I thought, Yes, I'll look at them, but again, I know nothing whatsoever about sea cat missiles. I climbed up onto the launcher and thought, ah, oh. I grabbed hold of the wings of the one of the missiles, two of the launcher, and lifted. I found I could lift them. I thought, oh, oh bloody hell, I'll lift them off the launcher and I'll use my favourite routine, tie a bit of rope around them and lower them over the side as well. And I managed to do that without the assistance of my two guys. Then went on to the bridge and said to the sub-lieutenant, that's it finished. You have no more damaged Mark 10 mortar bombs. You have no more damaged sea cap missiles on board. I thought he was going to kiss me, but he didn't. You weren't allowed in those days. You would be now, but there we are. Uh, he said, should I get hold of the captain, Mr. Phillips? I said, no, leave him on the forecastle and let him finish the psalm that they're singing at the moment. Then please get him. The captain came back onto the bridge, shook my hand, and said, Thank you very much indeed, Mr. Fellows. I told him really what we'd done and what actions we'd taken. And he said, Did you have any problems at all? I said, No, no, it all went very, very well. Thank you. Uh, I said, The only thing was the singing. He said, Oh, a bit of a religious nature. He said, Ah, are you not of a religious persuasion, Mr. Fellows? I said, Well, it's not that. It did stink a little bit of lack of confidence. He said, well, look, can I be completely candid with you? And I said, well, yes, please, sir. He said, my ship had been through hell of a lot. We were hit by bombs. We were on fire. We were lucky to survive the conflict. We'd mm -hmm. really been in the thick of it, and Plymouth had. Mm -hmm. He said, I knew I had unexploded bombs, water bombs on board. I didn't know whether I still had Argentinian bombs on board or not. He said, I call for help. They sent the only bomb disposal man available in the Southern Hemisphere to help. You arrived on board. I thought, Christ, he's pissed. <laughs> he says, there was, there was a certain lack of confidence, Mr. Fellows. <laughs> <laughs> I, I went back to Sir Tristram and uh, told the guys. Following that, I had a fairly quiet war in as much that Peace was uh, declared not so long after that. We then had not a pleasant job, but the job of going around most of the uh, buildings in state and cleared all the trenches and the uh, areas that uh, the RG to Jews. Unfortunately, while we were in 
Navy Point, we found 12, un, 12 un, uh, Argentinian sailors that had all, without any doubt whatsoever, been executed, shot behind the head. All in naval uniform. I took cap ribbons off three of them just to prove their existence and reported the fact uh, to the, the ops room that we had set up in Stanley at that time. They are all very, very young uh, sailors, Argentinian sailors. Uh, it's very sad. Very, very sad. Mm. Uh, we then, uh, once we finished uh, all your IEDs and bombs, went uh, back on, on Fearless to be told that uh, we were going to travel on Fearless back to Ascension Highlands. Which where we would be lifted off by Chinook and we would be the first team repatriated back to the UK, and we were. Mick, can we just clarify for our friends at home? I'm I'm guessing they were shot for desertion or or or, or something. Shot. They they were shot by their own side. Yeah. I reported this, and I went to the Board of Trade Inquiry for the for the damage on the Tristram afterwards because I'd I'd written a report on the Tristram about bits and pieces I didn't particularly like as a seaman, but that, that was, so I was asked, and, and, and I mentioned again then, it was uh, forgotten. As were my reports on the bomb removal on the Plymouth and the uh, Antrim. Yes. I don't know why. Definitely shot by the own side. Mm. And sorry, carry on, mate. I just wanted to clarify that for Right. Uh, I'd say that, that was the end of my 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 uh, Auckland's conflict. Uh, 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 the end only in as much as the, the, the one good thing, as far as I was concerned, uh, I, I was invited to Number Ten down the street for the victory celebration dinner, which was extremely uh, oh, very honoured, extremely pleased. I was the only non-commissioned officer there. Couldn't get anyone more junior than me, uh, all the admirals, generals, war staff, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. I was told to be there at, at 6.30, a little bit earlier uh, than probably uh, the, the rest of the, the guests. But I met the police on, on the main gate and said, what's the procedure? As a most junior person, do I go in first or do I wait till last? They didn't know, but they said, it's probably best to wait till last. And then why don't you go to the pub around the corner there where some of the special branch are in there having a pint. Because you're in uniform, no one will really uh, bother you. A couple of points, went in, met Mrs. Thatcher, and I have a lovely photograph shaking hands with her as we went in. Went to a dinner and met some very, very interesting people, including they put me fairly close to Michael Clapp, so at least I had someone with a little who knew a little bit about my background that I could talk to, and, and the commander in chief fleet as well. My wife then joined us, so as all the wives did at 2311 o'clock after the main dinner. Uh, for, 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 for another reception. About halfway through the reception, Mrs. Uh, Thatcher, the Prime Minister, said to me, Mr. Fellows, I want to give you a special treat for all the help you did. I'm going to show you uh, something I treasure very much in the Cabinet Room. Bring your wife. So we went into the Cabinet Room. There's a long Cabinet table there, covered with a nice green baize cover. And she said, when the Falklands conflict came about and the Argentinians invaded, she said very few people knew where the Falklands were. She said, we had no maps at all of it in the building. So I sent one of my senior civil servants down to the bookshop around the corner to buy an atlas. She said, and look what he came back with. She showed me this atlas. She said, there's 20 pages. So we had to take the stables out and sellotape all the pages together so we could get a complete picture of the Falkland Islands. And he said, and we couldn't do that on the, on the cabinet table because it's covered in green baize. She said, so we did it on the floor beneath the table. She said, stand back and look. I stood back and I could see this map underneath the cabinet table. She said, right, come with me under the table. She said, and I'll show you where you worked. I said, yes, ma'am. So I got onto my hands and knees. On the table underneath, she said, this is St. Carlos. She said, and your first bomb was just outside there. She said, then you went right over here. She said, as the bomb marines were yomping across here. And as she said here, she leaned over to me, grabbed me by the shoulders, and kissed me on the lips. 
the Prime Minister kissed me on the lips. I was so shocked, I attempted to stand up, forgetting I was underneath the cabinet table, which was a thick oak table. I nearly put myself out unconscious, almost. I could see stars. I dragged myself out from under the table. She stood me upright, helped me to stand upright, as my wife did as well, held on to my hand and said, Mr. Fellows, ever since I've been a little girl, I've wanted to kiss a sailor in uniform. <laughs> kiss the Prime Minister. Cuffed. Mick, this is why I try to avoid world leaders. You know, it's I, I can't. Oh, they want a quick snog. I'm um, like, sorry, my love. <laughs> sorry, my love. Like you, you just go and run your country. I'll, 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 I'll do some podcasting or something. Yes, <laughs> I, I left there and went back to the, the, the Navy. They kindly put me up in the Dorchester Hotel. Six in the morning, I left down the street. Arrived back at Dorchester Hotel at six thirty, only to meet Commander North, as he was then. He's now, of course. Uh, so, uh, oh, Lord North, uh, uh, he's waiting outside and he said, I knew your story, Mr. Fellows, the bombs you've gone on the ship. He said, you didn't have to do it on my ship, it sank, unfortunately. He said, but I've kept the bar open to buy you a pint. I said, it's half six in the morning, sir. I'd had an awful lot to drink then. I've got a muster to march through the city of London at half seven. He said, I've organised that. You'll no longer be in the group in the front, he said. You'll be in the second group, and I've got a sailor on either side to navigate you through the streets of London. <laughs> so we had a couple of points before we marched. Mick, what was it what was it like coming home? How how did you get back to the UK and what kind of response did you meet? We we we, we were lifted by a, a Chinook helicopter off a of fearless. You could only put two wheels on the back end and when we climbed on board. Uh, we, we got to Ascension where an RPO, regulating petty officer, said, right, there's a bar been open for you, you can have a few drinks, not too many because you're flying home in a VC-10 tomorrow. We totally ignored him and had quite a few drinks. We arrived in Bryce Norton and we met by Hamish Loudon, the chap from Sing Fleet who I'd met, uh, Tony Lombard, Dave Forty, a few, few of our officers, and superintendent of diving. Told My guys were told that... Uh, they, they had a fortnight's leave straight away. Their wives were there, most of them were very good. I had to go back with my uh, command officer to Vernon. I was given a lift back by superintendent diving so we could do a, a little bit more debriefing and then sent home that, that evening so that we, we were family, so it's no problem. It, it took a while for me to settle down. Uh, Every loud sort of loud bang and noise. I was trying to dive under the kitchen table or the dining room table, as you do. It, 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 took, it took a took a were, little while. Were you were you were you married, Mick? Yes, married to three daughters. Oh uh, gosh! And I, unfortunately, and I only found out about a month or so ago. Unfortunately, when the bomb exploded on on the Antelope, my my wife had been told that I'd been killed. And two days later, told no, it wasn't me. My daughter was doing her A levels, my eldest daughter. So it was pretty more of an horrendous time from the family than it was for me. Did they? Oh, yeah. not very good at all for the family. Oh. I'm just, you know, I see the upset in my son's eyes when I go on an expedition for the weekend and he thinks I yeah. might not come back, you know, and it, it, it has, I mean, have they, have you ever like had a good old chat with your daughters about this time? And have they told you what, what it meant to them as kids that, that no. their, their daddy was down there doing all this? Well, to, to, yes, to, to us, yes, I have to say that, but not, quite a long time after us. I corresponded as much as I could, which wasn't very much at all. I think quite a few of the letters I sent home were lost. Quite a few of the letters my wife had sent me were lost. The unfortunate thing about our task down there, like so many others, we were moving around all over the place, you know, for, for the posty to try and find us was very, very difficult. Uh, I, I told them they, they didn't query me after the war. They, they helped me to, 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 to get over it. I had other jobs to do. 
uh, after the conflict. Uh, I wrote my book uh, once I retired, I was, well, after my 77th birthday, during the lockdown for COVID, really so that they could then understand what I, what I did. They knew I was in the bomb disposal business because they, they, they'd seen that since they were born. Mm. Uh, when I was married, uh, I was in the... Well, I was on the, a mine hunter then, but in the Scottish more Northern Ireland bomb disposal team and then the Far East team. Uh, so they've been with me quite a bit. Quite a bit. Uh, I was asked a couple of times if I'd like counselling and all that, but I said, not really. I, I may come in and a few beers would probably be quite sufficient. Thank you. I'm, I'm happy about that, mate. You know, it's... Um people deal with different things in different way. And I think our life experiences affect how we interpret different things. But I'm, I'm so glad you've come through it so strong. Is it, do, do you think, Mick, like you've just told us a story that like the world hasn't bloody heard. No. And it, and it's phenomenal and it's incredible. And, and obviously it's in your book. We're going to folks link for the book. Um, uh, link for Mick's wonderful book, which is called Not for the Glory, which <laughs> I think is self-explanatory. Um, but do you ever think, Mick, like, say, for example, the Second World War, all these stories were going on, weren't they, of people yeah. that were doing untold things that never got any recognition? Not that I'm, you know, uh. saying... They sh well, I, I, I don't know what I'm saying, but you know, people will do such brave things, won't they? For for for, for their for their nation, I guess, for their family, for their for their for the unit. Yeah, I, I I did what I was trained to do. I I didn't expect to ever be in a situation where I was dealing with an explosive device where I couldn't evacuate everyone from the area, and I've done that dozens of times, and even in Ireland, in conflicts, in Hong Kong, and the Red Gullet Rising. But when you get to a situation where you've got 450 men on a ship, which you know if your procedures are wrong, and there was no procedure, it was the procedure I'd made up. If that was wrong, not only were you going to kill yourself, you were going to kill all these people as well. It was pretty awful. The good thing that comes from it is I have... 450 very, very, very good friends now on the HMS Antrim crew and 250 very, very, very good friends and wives on HMS Plymouth crew. And that, that really is gratifying to be able to say, without a doubt whatsoever, I saved 700 people and I can give you their names if you want. It, it, it's a great feeling. You don't do it the medals and the make amends and the awards you do it because that's what you're paid to do uh, you, but but you don't expect to do it in those sort of circumstances you're not trained to do it in those circumstances nobody foresee it or saw it ever happening there was no precedent hopefully there won't be again in the future yes let's pray let's pray not i'm i'm, yeah. I'm guessing in the royal navy community in the 80s there was Lots of babies named Mick. Uh, <laughs> yes, I, I met, met. I've met quite a, a lot of the wives, and uh, I'm in touch with John Phillips, a good friend of mine who lost his arm. We, we meet as often as possible, and of course, the Sam eighty two and various. But but it's nice knowing that I, I get an email every now and again from one or two of the guys, or off guy on the Antrim, saying we're still in our thoughts. And my wife's Mick. Thank you. It, it's great. Utterly fascinating. Absolutely. Just, I think you, you, you've blown us all away. We, we were going to talk, I'm just looking at my notes here. Um, you're an inspector of clearance diving for special forces. Can you tell us a bit about that? Well, I, I, I would go down to Hereford. Uh, the, the Hereford had, in their boat troop, had uh, chaps trained in mixed gas and air diving, but they're set up in, uh, in in their barracks down there, wasn't sterling lines, wasn't very good. They had a lovely big swimming pool, which one side of it looked like the casing of a, a submarine. They could simulate anything up to almost a force eight gal in there if they needed. 
Mm. They had Germany's bits and pieces in there, but they had no air charging arrangements or bits and pieces. So I was able to design and get built on using the right authorities an air charging system for them to uh, sort of things, uh, assist them in producing equipment to access ship sides. Uh, explosive systems and pneumatic systems and, and, and generally help them out uh, with their diving. There, there was quite a bit of inter-service rivalry between them, the SBS and the SAS, quite as you would expect. Um, probably the CDs, everyone likes to think they're the best and all this and they don't necessarily talk to each other. They were using various different uh, equipments uh, to do the same job. I would spend a month uh, on and off at Hereford and then go down to uh, Paul with the SPS, who didn't need all that additional advice. It, it, it was more setting up a better relationship between the two of them than, than actually telling the SB what to do. We, we, we trained with the SB quite a lot uh, as clearance divers. Uh, they, they came to us for mixed gas diving. We used to go for them uh, to them for canoeing. They, 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 would, they would give us the canoes with no bloody backrests and the biggest cr crappy ones they had. So, so we, we, we did the same when we took them to mixed gas diving. We made sure they had all the garbage as well. So good, good liaison between the two. But it really was to set up what, in fact, then turned out to be the combined force that they've got now before they fully amalgamated the, the two, which has taken quite a while, but they all work under the, the same command now. Then they were under sec separate command. The Army Command operated the SAS, Navy op operated the uh, mm. SPS. It just didn't work. There, were, there was a blue on blue down there, which perhaps shouldn't have happened. Uh, even on my role in Bluff Cove, where we were talking to the Army, engineers who were with us doing the help to do the beach clearance and the SPS we between the three of us three units there we found out it was very difficult to understand each other's procedures there was there was no there been no liaison whatsoever that, that I, I went from there to say to uh, to being the inspector of, of uh, or the, the assistant superintendent of diving I was inspector of clearance divers and special forces. The uh, clearance diving side came about because in my younger days as a chief, I worked in Northwood for the uh, fleet clearance diving officer. I was his warrant officer, and I had to travel around all the ships in the fleet talking to the ship's divers and helping them resolve any problems that they had. Mm -hmm. and, and, and that worked very, very well, and they were always pleased to see me because it was, it was assisting them, not knocking them. Uh, and it worked so well. And I can remember saying to my boss at that time, Lieutenant Commander John Ritchie's, bloody hell, we could do with a similar sort of person in the clearance line branch. Could all of our teams do their own bloody thing? Even as much as they paint their own, own land rovers, their bomb wagons, different uh, colours, etc., etc. So so when I when I returned after the Falklands, John Ritchie's was made superintendent of diving and said, can you remember some time ago, Mick, you said we could do with someone looking after the clearance diving teams and putting them right? I said, yeah. He said, well, you've got the job. I thought, that, that was great. I kept that job till I left the service in 1990. Mm. I left in 1990. Or well, before that, we, we, we'll, we'll go on. March the 6th, my last two jobs. March the 6th, 1987, the Herald of the Enterprise sank. Bell doors were left open uh, in Zabruga with 191 missing people at the time. I was duty officer in Vernon, and my task at that particular time, or task I took on, was uh, mobilising our teams to go across there by helicopter to assist as much as possible initially uh, getting survivors out. This lasted about, about 48 hours. And we realized that there, 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 nobody else that we could uh, rescue. I was then invited with a superintendent of diving to go across to Belgium to talk about what had happened and to give a verbal report and to offer assistance and advice on the uh, salvage operation to recover the, the victims, not, not the ship itself. 
and I came up with quite a few ideas because I, I'd recovered a few bodies from crashed aircraft and various things in the past, quite a few. And so I had a few, uh, from through experience, suggested a few things, which obviously impressed the Belgian Authority so much so they said, well, would you like to do it, Mr. Fellow? So once you're asked, and, then you've got to. I went across then on the 6th of March, or 7th of March, with a team of uh, six clearance divers, which came from the fleet clearance diving team. Uh, Eddie Kerr was the chief with me. And a team of, uh, uh, an addition, uh, team of five Belgian clearance divers. And uh, we went on board. It, it was pretty hard finding accommodation and getting ourselves sorted out in, in, in Zeebrugge. Uh, because it was closed down for the for the winter, but we we, we got accommodation, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Then went on board the, the the ferry. Once they got it upright, it took quite a few weeks to get to get it upright. Uh, about six to eight weeks, I believe it was. I can't remember exactly now. We we went out to the ferry once she was upright, stable by by helicopter, and we were winched down on board, and we went onto the uh, bridge, and I had already made out a sort of a state board and we had the state board on the bridge and uh, it, it, it was a sort of a, a, a backboard drawing of the whole of the ship, all the various compartments and uh, the superintendent diving command Jack Burkett had come with me to do the liaison with all of the, the media from all over the world was there uh, so, but he came on board on the first day and I said to him I said, if you stop on the bridge and as we search each compartment and we know it's clear, we'll let you know. And you could just note all these on, on the state board as such. Mm -hmm. Great idea. But it wasn't long uh, after we started, about an hour or so, and we went down the first deck, that we realised where the ferry had been on the sandbank for a few weeks, all, all the mud black mud had washed in through the open bow doors mm. and filled all of the compartments. It had collapsed an awful lot of the bulkheads, which really were prefabricated, almost cardboard bulkheads, you know, so, so thin. And, and so we had a problem, just, just getting clearance. So I, I organised a tugboat to come alongside high-pressure hoses on board. And the hoses took two men to, to hold, one to hold it, one to operate, they, they were that powerful, but they, they did the job. And we'd go into each compartment, starting, uh, we give the Belgians one deck to do, and then we did the next deck, and we started from the bells, working after, and we blast our way in the compartment through the mud with the high pressure hose. I had to cut some holes in the ship side as well, because I was putting so much water in it, I was a bit worried about stability. Uh, so it drained away. And as, as we came across a, a, a corpse, uh, we were gently as gently as possible as we cleared the mother around the corpse, clear the corpse, pick up any obvious belongings to the corpse. If it was a woman, invariably, there was a handbag. We found an awful lot, of, a lot of ex-servicemen on or servicemen on ex on the boat that still had their duty free in the carrier bags in the hands. They hadn't ditched them when they were trying to get off. Uh, but we, 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 we got all those together. And then we had to take the bodies right aft on the ferry so that we could initially lift them off by chopper, but then lift them onto a, a tugboat and take them ashore. Uh, we, we worked very, very slowly through all the compartments. And, and, and the vehicle compartments, of course, and you'll see some pictures, I'm sure you have, uh, the, uh, Vehicles smashed all, all over the place. There were no drivers in, but we had to search for drivers. A lot of drivers in the, uh, in the restaurant area and some, that they got a free cabin when they got on board, some in the cabins, mm. which were down below by the engine room. All the engine room doors had automatically closed when the ship sank. So we had to open those up with hydraulic pumps. Uh, the, 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 the lorry drivers invariably are fairly big guys anyway we've been underwater for length for time they'd taken on lots more water they're extremely heavy so i got hold of six tin baths the ones i used to use when i was a small lad in the 40s 
and we, we, we would put the corpses into a tin bath with their belongings, and when we could drag the tin bath on a piece of rope along the upper or along the deck, the passageways to the after deck, rather than try and carry the, these heavy corpses. We got to the, uh, the, the canteen part of the, uh, the, the, the ship, and this is one of the parts, in fact, the opening bit in my book. Horrendous experience there because as, as I played, I had the hose with my lead diver, Paddy Junior, behind me, holding the weighted hose. I pushed the hose, and what I soon realized was a large glad glass panel which ran the full length of the dining room, setting the, di the dining room into two. And as I blasted the mud, it blasted it off, the, off this glass panel. There were 20 or 30 dead people behind the panel with their faces pressed against the glass. We've all done that as a child at home. Press your hands and your face against the glass and look at mum, flatten your nose on the other side. It was horrendous, really bloody awful. A lot of those people, we had to separate, forcibly separate their arms and legs. They were entangled together to, to be able to put them in the bath and to carry them back aft. The, 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 the entire operation took us seven weeks to complete. We recovered 191 people in that time. We missed one small baby, 18 months old. Just, just, and I, well, I have my theories of what happened to that small baby. We had to use high pressure pumps to take out some of the water and mud that we were diluting. And, you, know, you can imagine what may have happened. It was bloody awful. The families were on the jetty when we landed each night by chopper or tugboat with photographs of their relatives. And as I said earlier, I, I, I've developed over the years my own mind. I, I can actually blank out faces of dead people when I'm looking at them. I, I'd learned this well before the hell job. And I can just say, I know it's a man, a woman, a child, a boy or a girl. A lorry driver because he's bloody heavy, but that, that's all. I couldn't tell the features, the faces, I couldn't recognize them again ever. Albeit on one day when we had not an awful lot to do, it's too rough for us to get on the boat. We went to visit the mobile mortuary that was there. They invited us to come in and have a look at the condition of some of the people we recovered, and they really did a brilliant job in making the dead people respective before they hands them back to their relatives. A brilliant job. Irish company it was, can't remember the name. Uh, a brilliant job. That was the held of the by job. Seven weeks. Uh, a terrible job, terrible job. Probably one of the worst jobs I think ever. I've recovered lots, I wouldn't say hundreds, but an awful, no, not probably hundreds. Yes, I covered, recovered a, a VC Ted at one time, which was full of paratroopers. Uh, but uh, lots of uh, bodies, but they've always been uh, either men or elderly people, military men, or in, in, when I was in the Far East team, they're always recovering people from the monsoon ditches that fallen in. But I'd never ever had the task of recovering young children, families all together holding hands or in the same cabin. Bloody, bloody awful. We had people in fridge spaces that were trying to escape in the dark and just open doors thinking this is the exit. It was the a deep freeze and things like that. It was horrible. Had a good team, brilliant team, uh, who stuck with it all the time. Young divers, all of them. Yeah. Mick, I'm, I'm just guessing it's just best you don't remember those faces, isn't it? Because if, if you start getting into the... Yeah. The, what do you call it? Like the interpersonal politics, that then you... Then you, you then become attached to the families that want to know how their loved one died, and then then you become a part of their life for the rest. And yes. it, and you you don't deserve no, that, you no, know. You you no. you need to be outside of no, that. No, no. You know, it, it's yeah, it, 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 it's a job, and it's one. At the end of the day, you can look back again in reflection and think at least those parents and relatives now had someone to mourn and bury properly. Uh, and that's, that's again, so I'm not a particularly religious guy, but having said that, I've prayed to everyone in the time, you know. <laughs> I'm a friend of Allah and Jesus and the whole lot. Of, uh, I've tried them all and seem to have worked. But, uh, but, but uh, it's nice to be able to 
hand mm. people back for a proper Christian or Muslim or whatever funeral. How how did the um, Belgium government treat you? They were very very good. Uh, we were invited over. I was awarded a uh, MBE for that. Uh, we were invited over to meet the King of the Belgians. Uh, went over to my best number ones as you do. Went to the palace and uh, waited a while. And eventually, a couple of guys wandered in. One was smoking a cigarette and a pair of jeans and a jumper, and other chap was looked a little bit smarter. And they come across him. We were chatting away for ages, and he said, "Oh, well, uh, you know, there's some food laid on uh, shortly." I said, "Well, you know, we we saw the food, but really waited to meet the king before we sort of take advantage." And he said, oh, "I am the king." <laughs> but what a what a smashing chap turned out to be. They, they were good. The Belgium divers were very good. We started off with a fairly large team. They dwindled in size after a period of time. They, they were young lads, and it was a bloody awful job. Uh, yeah, they were, yes, they did. One of my guys, when we finished the job, uh, asked if he could. He left a bit early. Pincher Martin uh, went with the back to the fleet team, and they went on another job where involved in a little bit of water skiing in the pleasure time. And it, about a week after we'd finished the job, he was skiing, uh, had an accident on the ski, broke his back and currently in a wheelchair now. Sad, pinch of Martin. My last job in the Navy, a few weeks uh, before I left, in fact, in September 88, not weeks, a couple of years before I left, uh, I was again assistant superintendent driver at that time, and we had a signal in saying HMS Southampton in the Persian Gulf had been in collision with the SS Tall Bay, large ship, very large ship, been a collision and damaged her port side and ripped open the uh, sea slug uh, magazine. And uh, that, that had flooded. Uh, Sorry, mate, is, it, is this? Program. Did you say SS? Is that an American ship? Yeah, merchant, merchant ship. Uh, okay. Merchant uh, cargo ship. Sea uh, Dart. Sorry, Sea Dart missiles. Getting confused, old age. Yeah, Sea Dart missiles in, in the magazine. Uh, assist. So uh, the superintendent divers said, right, big fly out there. Look at the situation, see what we can do. More with the missiles. There's other people responsible for salvage and doing the repairs, etc. Again, but your job is purely the missiles. Make me out. So I said, yeah. I said, but I'm about to leave the Navy. Haven't got too long to do now. And my relief, Colin Kidman, one of Colin Kidman has joined. Can I take him? I said, Why not? Good idea. So we went into Portsmouth Dockyard initially uh, to look round a sister ship of the Southampton to get a feel where the magazine was, how these missiles, had never seen one before, were housed in the magazine, how they were sewed, et cetera, et cetera, and get a general feel around the ship. Then we, 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 we flew out to the Persian Gulf uh, to, to uh, look at the ship. We went straight from the airport onto the ship itself, put on an old pair of ovals, and look at the damage on the outside, got hold of a couple of air diving sets off the ship, and I dived in through the gash in the starboard side, uh, so port side, so port side, swam actually into the magazine. And there, there was one dummy missile used for loading packs, so I assume, floating in the way, so we sort of eased that out through the magazine, then had a good look at all the state of the missile, still in their racks, but some jammed and pushed against bulkheads, etc. And uh, all around, scouts have swimming around with me. We disregarded it as I quite often did the diving rules and regulations about lifelines and signals and standby divers and all that sort of cobblers. And uh, we were looking around and I thought, I just don't. No idea hit me out of the blue. So I, I went onto the, the sort of channel plate in the back of the magazine and I laid on my back on my diving set and I was looking up right and I thought, this again is similar to the Antrim. I know that above us, there's a four-inch gun or a gun on a forecastle, and there's a launching pad for these missiles. If I lift that gun off and I lift those missiles off, 
and I cut a bloody big hole, I can lift all these damaged missiles up through that. And as I was, that left thought was going through my mind, Scouse came swimming over, feeling like hell in a bit of a panic, grabbed hold of me, thinking I'd passed out or I was unconscious on the floor of the magazine, <laughs> but in fact I was dreaming. So we got out again, and I told Scouse, night Scouse, I think we could possibly do this. And instead of sheer legs and a bloody take on, we'll cut a big hole, a really big square hole, and we'll fabricate a gantry above it. We're in a dockyard. We'll get them to make a gantry and we'll weld it to the upper deck with railway lines on top of it and takeoffs that move along the railway line. And we lift the missiles up one at a time, run them along the gantry, and we'll have a barge alongside. And in the barge, we'll put 24 metal coffins, little compartments full of water. So we can take them up and lower them all into the, their little coffin. And once we've got them in the barge, then that's somebody else's problem, not ours. So, great. We went back onto the upper deck, looking rather scruffy, hosed ourselves down because there's a lot of oil and muck in, in the uh, magazine. And uh, a, a, a commander come up in his sparkling white suit and said, you, Mr. Fellows, yep. He said, well, the, the Commodore is waiting for you in the lounge of the hotel. He's been waiting a while now. I said, oh, he said, uh, I can tell you he's not too happy a man. I said, oh, you know, I thought I'd better come and get an idea of what the problem was before I saw him. And nobody's told me he wants to see me anyway. So he said, you're obviously going to change. We was in overalls covered in diesel and smelled a little bit at the time. So I thought, yep. So we did. So we changed into the Potter's tracksuit bottom. No, no, they, they were sort of woolly ones at that time. The crutch used to hang round about your knees. They weren't too smart looking. And I had a nice clean white T-shirt on. So, so yes, we both got dressed in that. Us as gym shoes. And we arrived, went to the hotel. We got a lift to the hotel. Went into the reception, said, where's the meeting? They told us where it was in the conference room. Went to the conference room, opened the door. And there were lots of talking. As soon as we opened the door, there was a dead silence. And we looked in. And there must have been 50 or 60 officers and senior representatives there, all in their starch white suits with gold braids and medals all over the place. <laughs> like they were going for divisions on parade. <laughs> and Commodore Moore, who looked to Pony Moore, who again I knew very well from his younger days, was at the end of the table. And he said, hello, Mick. Nice to see you come dressed for the occasion again. <laughs> that was the introduction. And I said without thinking, did I come to help you move the missile, sir, or go to fucking divisions? <laughs> <laughs> he said to two commanders in the front, shift, Colin, Mick, your friends, sit there. Yeah. Uh, we told him what we found, told him what my suggestion was, lots of engineer commanders, ship constructors, et cetera, et cetera. Scratch the head and couldn't think of anything else to do, any other better thing. Thought we'll have to strengthen the side, put strengthening bars before we cut the upper deck, large H bars, etc., etc. Normal engineering type strengthening bits and pieces. I thought, fair enough. Obviously, you've got to do that, etc., etc. Uh, and then we'll do it. He said, What else do you need? So, well, we need a, a larger team. You know, we could put another half a dozen divers be handy from, from, from Portsmouth, etc. And uh, we can go. To write, and we arranged to meet again the following morning. Went back to the hotel, and there was a signal there waiting for me saying, return to Portsmouth as soon as possible on first flight. Leave, leave warrant officer Kidman there to carry on with whatever's got to do. So, so I flew back and left Scouts there to carry out the job, which took, him about, took about eight weeks in all told. They did that procedure, which worked very well. And then they towed the barge out to a secret location, but very, very deep water, just outside the Gulf, with scouts on board the barge. So when he got to the right position, he opened a couple of Kingston valves, filled it up with uh, water, and sank to the seabed. I was required back urgently in the UK, so the deputy superintendent diving could go on holiday. What oh, whoopee. <laughs> I was really at that stage... Glad I was leaving the name. Mick, on that subject, what what have you got to say or what words of advice can you give 
for young men or, or women now that might might be doing the job that that you've done it's the the clearance diving branch as far as i'm concerned is the best branch in the Royal Navy. obviously i'm sure to say that it is it's the selection in my particular time was 85 percent failure rate and an awful a large failure rate on, on on the course itself there were 35 people starts on my course six of us finished but once you're in as a clearance diver, it, it's a brilliant job. You, you're you not too involved, in my days, you weren't too involved in exercises, firing guns, etc., etc. It's an essential part. In my time, there was so much rubbish left after the Second World War. You didn't have to exercise. No, you have to because it's a different kettle of fish. And they do exercise. They're still special forces to a certain extent. They now all qualify in parachuting and, and various other trades on top of the diving side as well. It's, in my opinion, still the best branch of the Royal Navy to be in. Uh, it, it, it's, it's exciting work. At times you're left for your, to your own uh, initiative. Uh, I would do it all again at the top of the hat. It, 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 it's... Uh, yeah, we have, I, th I think there's one or two young ladies qualified now. I know some have qualified in the past. Mm. Uh, why not? Why not? Yes. Yeah. And Mick, what, why would you say, uh, why is it that bootnecks are, are so much more handsome than the matlows? <laughs> well, I don't go in the water too much today. <laughs> <laughs> I had to dress like a bootnecker at one time, and I've got a bit of a rollicking. Uh, at one time, I got a letter at a bogart officer from the captain of Vernon saying, Mr. Fellows, Royal Naval Dress Regulations, Article 1, 2, blah, 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 state that if you request to grow a beard, you will grow a full beard and mm. cease to use a razor. I wish you to. Uh, abide by those regulations. I've always trimmed my beard. And I thought, <laughs> bloody hell, what can I do? So I went back to him and I asked if I could go and see him. And uh, he said, yes, you can. And I said, uh, I, I understand, so you'll know from my naval records that I spent uh, quite a bit of time in the provinces in Northern Ireland. He said, yes, I know that. I said, well, when I was there, I worked with the SBs and, and other people uh, quite a lot. I said uh, they all grew their long hair. They had to quick in those days and we wore whatever rags we could. I said it's bloody obvious I wasn't going to grow my hair very long. So I thought I'd reshape my beard so it looked like a silly beard. I said and I'm now regularly going across for court cases and I don't want to fly over there now looking like a mat though who's just come out of dress uniform Say no more, Mr. Fellows. That's it. So I got away. I think I'm the only man that's ever had a, an official bollocking for having a non service beard. I've kept it ever since. Uh, there's good days, there's bad days. Mick, listen. I employed some booties as well. When I left and set up my own company, which is another long story, but I carried on to my 77th birthday, uh, I had two SPS guys working with me in Somalia for four years, basically, as well as looking for mines and, and blowing up munitions, and adding some protection as well. We weren't allowed to be armed. We were working mainly with medicine on frontier, but, but we, we were able to hide guns in various places, and we had expertise if we needed them. I didn't trust Matt those with guns. <laughs> Still don't. <laughs> Mick, listen, WO2... Uh, sorry, W Warrant Officer First Class McFellows, friends, MBE, DSC, BEM. Mick, I, 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 I'm almost at a loss for words, which is not good as a podcast host, but just thank you so much for everything you've done.
not just from myself and my wonderful, wonderful audience out there, my 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 friends. Um, I, I I know I speak for every Royal Marine, and 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 every serviceman. It it and, and you know that's before we talk about the Belgian public. It it, it you've you've lived an incredible life and you've done incredible things and i'm just so happy that we we could uh cover this on you know in in our mere chat of what is it like two hours um i'm sure we could talk for for 20 20 hours and not even not even really even cover the bases of it all but mick thank thank you so much what what does the future hold for you now? Because you don't, you don't look like a man that's um, about to hold back. Uh, when I left the Navy, which was another story, and if you read my book, Love the Glory, you see that I, I did a further 23 years as a commercial bomber mine disposal man on land and underwater. Uh, and had some exciting times there, very, very exciting times in areas where war had just finished and there was no law and order whatsoever. Uh, I retired on my 77th birthday, having at that just completed four years in northern Iraq after the war there, clearing the minefields and the unexploded weapons. Uh, I had to retire because I'd already contacted just about every tropical disease going. I'd had malaria twice, dengue fever, leishmanasia. I'd survived prostate cancer. Uh, and uh, I had heart failure uh, as a result of those. So I thought, well, it's a bit time. I, I, I packed it, uh, knocked it up, uh, knocked it in, and uh, sort of did a bit of gardening instead. I'm now 82, and uh, I still do a bit of gardening, but the book took me a, a year during lockdown, gave me something to do, fortunately. Uh, talking to people like you now gives me something else to do in the old time. Uh, it's been a pleasure talking to you. Uh, I, I, it's, it's nice. I enjoy talking about my exploits to people that are interested in this. You know, it's, it's, I did a job that I was very, very, very well trained for. My instructors were all Second World War, Pea Party and divers who'd actually done it. Uh, you know, well, I, I knew at one stage... In 1956, I counted, I personally had met and knew five Victoria Crosses from the Second World War. The people that now write books, I, I'd met. It, it was a brilliant branch to be in. When, when I worked commercially, I was able to employ ex-clearance divers and SPS, uh, people all, all, all over the world. So I worked with the same people with the same mindset. It, 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 it really was a brilliant life. Okay. Mink, do you, do you, would you dive at all now? Is that something you... No, I can't. Uh, I had not part of the story. I had a fractured skull. Uh, when I fractured my skull, uh, that would normally stop you diving totally. It does, normally. But I went for medical uh, with, with another good friend of mine who's now passed away, Commander Ramsey Pearson, Surgeon Commander Ramsey Pearson, who was a senior medical officer in the diving world at that time. And he said to me, Mel, well, Mick, he said, you, you've been diving a long time now. He said, I don't want to stop you diving and stop your diving pay. He said, what I suggest you do, he said, is carry on diving. He said, but I'll limit you to 50 metres. And if on the way down your head starts hurting, come up again quick. That was it. I carried on diving to 50 metres. Did the odd sneaky one to 75 when there was nobody looking. And then when I left the Navy... And, and I went for a diving medical, and the chap just started laughing and said, basically, bubble off. Yeah. So I, I, I had to stop diving. Yeah. And such is the rich tapestry of life. <laughs> yes. yes. Mick, massive thank you once again. I'm sure um, our, our audience, my friends, are going to want you to come back and, and chat again. Um. I wish you all the best in your your retirement. And to our friends at home, much love to you all. 
please look after yourselves. I really hope you've enjoyed this as um or I don't know if enjoy is the right word, but you 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 know what I'm trying to say. Incredible story. Um it, it's touched on parts of my life, the 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 Falklands, the Brugger. Um I, I never thought I would ever get to hear something so 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 grassroots um from from such a, a incredible gentleman if you could like and subscribe would really appreciate it and we'll see you next time thanks so much